Welcome to Think Tech on OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. Standing in for Jay Fidel with big shoes to fill, I'm Duko Ishii. And I'm your co-host, Lori Wingard. We'll cover the 2011 Asia-Pacific Clean Energy Summit and Expo that took place at the Convention Center last week. We'll check in at some of the panel sessions, we'll talk with some of the people we saw there, and we'll get some feedback on how it went. It was a three-day program organized by DBED and CTSI, a mainline clean energy industry organization at the Convention Center. The first day opened with keynotes from Governor Abercrombie, James Woolsey, former director of the CIA, and George Kaili Vai, U.S. Pacific Command. The first day featured Smart Grid, Managing Limited Water and Land Resources, Undersea Transmission, E-Tools to Accelerate Siting and Permitting of Renewable Energy Projects, and Energy as an Economic Growth Engine. Here's a panel discussion we attended that day on the use of government land and water in Hawaii. Public policy regarding land and water as it is associated with alternative energy has to recognize that we are part of a global economy competing for global resources. In terms of the total land area that we have in the state, it's approximately just over four, four million acres. And of that, the state fast lands consists of 1.38 million acres. Um, the jurisdiction of the, the state in Dillon R includes not only fast lands, though, they includes submerged lands up to the three mile limit. And combined, we have a total of 2.4, approximately 2.4 million acres that we oversee as a department. Everything having to do with water also has to do with energy. So when we're talking about water and talking about management of water, we're talking about energy and the management of energy. So just for context, uh, primarily we're looking at kind of that demand end, the management at the, at the end user. Um, and spending a lot of time trying to decide how that can best be managed and how that can best be used. So we look at context of water, and we're down to, you know, 1% of the water in this, this world is the type of water that I'm talking about the management of. About 100 years ago, Hawaii is about sugar and pineapple plantation just dominated, dominated the landscape. And today I want to talk about the former plantation lands that we manage. Um, first of all, I want to talk a little bit about ourselves, the Agribusiness Development Corporation, or ADC. Um, we are a state agency created to help transition ag agriculture from plantation-style operations to diversified agriculture. Um, one of our major goals is to protect and preserve former plantation land and irrigation infrastructures. Uh, the Office of Planning is an attached agency, uh, the Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism. We used to uh, be at one point in our um, past uh, attached to the uh, governor's office, but sort of was spun out at some point. Uh, the Office of Planning is generally responsible for advising the governor on statewide planning, which includes land use, but also includes other types of planning, strategic planning, and so, and so forth. The first thing you should know about water in Hawaii is that it's a public trust resource. And that means that water is not treated or viewed as private property. Uh, rather, water is a public resource that must be protected and managed sustainably for the benefit of Hawaii's current and future generations. In 1978, we amended our state constitution to recognize water as part of the uh, public trust. And in the constitutional amendment, it also called for the creation of an agency that would have the overall mandate to protect and manage the resources of the state. About a decade later, the legislature promulgated Chapter 174C, also known as the State Water Code. The key to long-term sustainability <clears throat> on an island with limited land and water resources requires a strategic and balanced approach to water resource management because land and water are so interconnected. A holistic watershed-based approach we find uh, balances resource protection with development and conservation. Later, we attended the panel discussion on the undersea cable that will connect the islands. Usually investors uh, in, uh, in power projects, uh, depending on whether they're industry player or they're private equity, uh, for equity risk over the long term, you know, they're not utilities. So, so for the most part, they're taking construction risk, they're not passing necessarily the cost through. 
to, uh, to the rate base. If things go bad, they lose it all. Uh, so their rates of return tend to be in, in the low 20s. Um, now, what, what, what happens is for them to enhance their return, so using the CREZ projects, for example, the regulated rate of return may be in the 11% range. However, you can, um, through, the, through additional leverage outside the regulated structure, you can basically enhance your rate of return. You don't increase the risk to, uh, to the project. You don't increase the risk of operations. You're basically shifting the risk to the lenders um, because we're, we're taking equity off the table because we're comfortable with the project. Okay. Let's say there's a project in Bill's terminology where your RFP comes out and you ask the developer and his or her sponsor to take all of the risk with a fixed price bid. So let's say we submit a fixed price bid in 2012 and we don't go into construction until 2014 and we don't finish construction until 2016. So for four years we are carrying interest rate risk, we are carrying exchange rate risk, and we are carrying the risk of some hurdle in the construction process that... You're also carrying the risk of not just exchange or risk, you're carrying the, the risk of just the equipment going up in price. Right. So in that case, if things go really, really well, I mean really, really well, you might hit 20% as an investor. If things go really, really badly, you guess wrong on interest rates or exchange rates, you, you, just, you can get screwed. I, I do want to add that you know, I, I'm, I'm the, the visionary guy on our team, and my partner would kill me if I said this. If I was a, the state of Hawaii or any other jurisdiction, I would make people put in fixed price bids because how else do you have discipline? And in a lot of the utility construction of transmission, we don't have that discipline, and you routinely get 50% cost overruns because somebody gets wrong about something. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we, we have reached bewitching hour, and uh, we very much appreciate your participation in this panel. The second day opened with keynotes by Lieutenant Governor Brian Schatz, Chris Myers of Lockheed Martin, Patricia Glaza of CTSI, and video remarks from Congresswoman Maisie Hirono. The second day featured panels in net zero energy, electric vehicles, how to get more solar electricity, policies and strategies that will transform the energy market, investor perspectives, greening the workforce, clean energy metrics, hydrokinetic and ocean thermal energy, and permitting energy projects in Hawaii. The third day opened with keynotes by TJ Glothier of TJG Energy Associates and Jason Hu, mayor of Taichung City in China. The third day of the summit featured panels in financing and incentivizing energy efficiency, waste to energy, geothermal, community engagement, among others. We saw lots of people we knew at the summit, including a number of legislators. Oh, I had a, I had a great afternoon. I got to sit on a panel. Um, with uh, Ian Chan Hodges, a couple guys from the Navy uh, R&D Division, Department of Educa Energy, uh, Robin Campaniano from Ulupono, uh, Roz Baker from the State Senate. We talked about Act 209, which was just uh, endorsed and approved by Governor Abercrombie a couple months ago. And I got to talk about the ingenuity component of the Sustainable Business Corporation and how it can actually set Hawaii apart from other states that have Sustainable Business Corporation type laws. Uh, one point is that we can protect patents probably better here, especially in light of the eBay uh, decision for protests of uh, injunction uh, relief. We think we can help um, people who own patents, control patents. We think that's going to make it more valuable here in Hawaii, so maybe we can invent some uh, trust funds or pension funds to uh, make some investment here. We think it also levels the playing field to some of your small mom and pops, uh, startup companies who uh, don't have the equity to sit at the table with the big kids and you cut some deals, we think this kind of brings them uh, to the table, gives them some leverage opportunity because of this status. So it was a great afternoon and good to be here and moving Hawaii forward and getting us uh, oil. Aloha, I'm Representative Gene Ward and I'm here because I believe there should be a solar on every roof in the state of Hawaii. We have the potential not only to be the world leader, but the, in the nation, we should be the model for other places to look at. I'm here to see what technology is available and particularly what financing is available in order to make this doable. Right now we give, unfortunately, too much lip service to we should be doing this stuff, 
we should be unequivocally the world leader in this, and we're not. So I'm here to learn, to see what the financing is available, and hopefully add to the political will so there'll be a solar on your roof, my roof, and everybody's roof, including Jay, who's doing the filming here. Thank you, and aloha. Well, we think it's a great show for Hawaii. We at the Hawaii Visitors and Convention Bureau really are trying to attract these type of renewable energy, stable energy types of companies to Hawaii, and also to showcase a lot of the core competencies of the same type of uh, companies that are here in Hawaii. And ultimately, in our case, we're trying to uh, attract their meetings and conventions with their own, within their own trade to either bring them here to the Hawaii Convention Center or throughout the islands at the various hotel properties with convention space. The reason that I'm here, and a lot of legislators are here, I, I, probably the same reason. We're here to listen and see what kinds of information is given out that may be useful when we go to the legislative session. Former uh, CIA Director Woolsey, and he talked about, uh, he made the analogy of salt, and how salt was like the, the oil of the day, and how uh, it, it generated uh, the efforts of governments and how they tried to acquire it, how they controlled it and all of that. And at the end of the day when electricity came to being and we had refrigerators and ice boxes and all of those things, what happened is that as a commodity it just dropped away. And he said his comment was when we make oil like salt. And I thought that was a great comment. And I think um, that's something we all need to do uh, and why we need to do alternative um, sources of energy. And I think they brought it home that we really need to uh, move away from, as he's saying, uh, paying money to countries that, one, don't like us, two, are, are autocratic or dictatorships, and how they control the flow, they control the cost, and we're at, we're at risk for all of that. And I think that really, I think, brings home to why a conference like this is so important. I came uh, because we have a great panel being moderated by Estrella Cease. And uh, our topic is supposed to be energy, the economic driver of our economy. And so I said, oh my goodness, what a big topic. And we have Connie Lau, we have Governor Ariyoshi, we have Mayor Kanoi, and we have some out-of-state experts. So I said, okay, this is the time for me to talk about what other states are doing and have some fun with it and see whether people shoot those ideas down and where we go. So I'm going to be talking about what some other states have done with um, online uh, on-bill financing, you know, where they've retrofit a lot of residential properties. And I really want to throw it out to the uh, group to say, you know, if you think this is a good idea, then, you know, maybe we should pursue this a lot more aggressively in Hawaii. But it'll be, I think it'll be a lot of fun because um, Many of the states now are really facing all kinds of budgetary challenges, so we have to be a lot more creative in what we come up with to stimulate green jobs. It's all about the economy, and energy is a part of that. After the summit, we checked in with some of the people who had been there to get feedback on how it went. We actually did a, a panel on funding innovative, disruptive energy technologies. Uh, we had quite a panel. Uh, from philanthropic to uh, public, primarily the federal side, um, as well as state government. So it was a really interesting panel. The, it was a packed room. So something tells me that, you know, of course, people are looking for funding sources to um, kick off new innovative ideas for energy. Um, I think a lot of what is there is the big infrastructure energy types of projects, right? I mean, you have the hydrogen car stuff, you have EVs, you have uh, wind. Hawaii's actually got this really unique opportunity because we're, you know, we're doing the big infrastructure projects, you know, wind, solar, and all of that, and that's really great. But I think where the real growth potential for Hawaii is in doing innovative energy technology development here in Hawaii. Okay, the third year of our summit was actually the most exciting. We got a lot of comments from the folks who attended saying, this year is really great. You know, actually the previous years we got comments, this is a really great event. So, um, you know, I, I hope they sincerely meant it. But it, from my perspective, it seems to have shifted a little bit. You know, you always have some visionary, you know, this is the potential and the policy stuff, and then you have a certain amount of the practical, people who have done projects, who are sharing the results, and, you know, their audience are hoping to learn from the experience and also sharing theirs. And I think it's actually shifted a little more to 
um, things have been built, things are in the process of being built. It's not all about we could do this, it's about we've actually started to do this, and in some cases we've done it. When you attend things like this, you meet people, or you explore, or find out about different avenues to solve the various problems that you're dealing with. You're connected with different people in the supplier development chain, for example, to solve maybe byproduct issues. You're connected to community leaders who can actually go up to a developer or landowner and say, hey, I have a problem with this. And the key part from that conversation is for reaction to that problem and genuine implementation. So we're really seeing that's where you can get communities on board with your project. It's one thing to listen to what they have to say, but it's another thing when they see you implementing. This conference, I think, really highlighted the success of, of doing that, of, of more working together. I thought that the conference this year was fantastic. You know, we do a lot of these conferences all around the world. And, um, you know, this one in particular was focused uh, and has been focused on Hawaii, uh, Department of Defense, and then, of course, Asian uh, regions. So, uh, you know, if you're interested in those locations, uh, this is a good conference. It was well attended. I thought that the sessions were very thoughtfully planned. The speakers were uh, nicely aligned. You didn't have a lot of uh, same speakers, uh, which I thought was very good because, you know, uh, in Hawaii, we've had a limitation as to uh, technical experts. So you tend to have the same person uh, on stage a lot, uh, me being one. Uh, and and I'm, I'm grateful that, you know, we could hear from different perspectives. The um, combination of, of this plus the uh, sister cities uh, event, which which was where uh, the uh, cities that are affiliated in some shape, way, or form with Hawaii cities uh, were here, so the different mayors were here. That was a nice touch because that brought in constituencies from different areas, um, energy ministers, for example, or energy um, department heads, I guess I should say. Um, that was good because from our standpoint, you know, we are looking to learn about what's happening around the world. We're hopeful to sell our, our solar panels to those locations as well. and. And what we do, we're always going out there, meaning that we're traveling constantly. This was the one time a year where they come to us. This was the third summit, and I thought this was the best yet. I think the past, it's been to attract investors, attract business, and it's been much more of an expo than a summit. Forty or so panels, and they were substantive. They, they range from renewable energy, energy efficiency, to even a panel, one only though, on uh, performance metrics, on policy, and workforce development, which was never there before. So it, it really was diverse. It, was, um, it, it gave opportunities for sharing, for learning, for discussion, for networking. Um, so I thought it was the best best yet and I saw a lot of people huddling I saw uh, the DOD the presence of the DOD with its funds its resources um, the opportunities uh, and they were very present with all the networking let's see next year if any of those uh, had traction any of those went forward or was it a lot of talk because you know we all know national international and local um, Fiscal conditions are pretty dire. The Asia Pacific Clean Energy Summit showed again that Hawaii is a laboratory for clean energy and that it's becoming a preeminent meeting place for international leaders and energy experts at the forefront of the clean energy movement. Many of the speakers were world renowned. They shared diverse insights into the implications of advanced renewable energy technologies and cutting edge projects, perspectives on policy, and investment in financing of clean energy projects. It's not only that the summit showed that Hawaii is an icon for the global development of clean energy, but the speakers were well chosen and dedicated to showing industry and government in Hawaii how we can better develop our resources. This was an important conference and chances are excellent that it will happen again next year and continue in the years to come. That said, we should all plan to attend again in 2012.
And now, here's our ThinkTech calendar of events going forward. On October 20th, ThinkTech will have its annual guest and speaker reunion at the Plaza Club, a rendezvous of its guests, hosts, speakers, moderators, thinkers and friends, and a great opportunity for everyone to get together. Hope to see you there. On October 27th, we will present our 2011 Update on Agriculture, featuring Russell Kokuban, State Director of Agriculture, and two blue ribbon panels examining current developments in agriculture in Hawaii. And now, here's Bill Spencer with this week's Spensation. Bill, thanks for coming down. So we're always interested in what kind of uh, subjects you want to come up with on the Spensations. What have you got this week? Money, Jay. Everybody needs it. A lot of corporations have it. I just read that corporations have stashed $3 trillion in cash. They're not putting it on expansion, they're not putting it into hiring, and they're not investing it. And that's troublesome to me. In Hawaii, it's even worse. You may know that uh, on October 4th, there's a venture capital summit being organized, and all of the VC participants are from the mainland. No local venture capital organizations. Ooh. Why do you think that is? There's no money. They don't have any money to invest. Uh, the ones that are coming are affiliated with the HITIP program, the Hawaii Technology Innovation Program that uh, was passed a few years ago by the legislature that allowed the ERS to put $21 million into local and mainland funds that would uh, focus some of their investing in Hawaii. Uh, but none of the local funds were able to come up with the match which was required by the law. Is that right? <laughs> uh, they also didn't meet the very high bar that was set uh, for venture firms to participate. So it's a, a pretty sad situation. And I know people in the venture industry that simply haven't been able to raise any investment capital. This is a sorry state of affairs. It is a sorry state because you know there's some money out there, but, but uh, nobody wants to invest it. That's what it amounts to, right? It seems that way. I mean, we still have a, a strong angel investor network, but those angels have to be balanced out by follow-on capital. Right. What good does it do to seed a company that can't get later stages of funding right. to help it advance? And uh, if we don't start investing more in our own backyard, we're going to lose out on the whole concept of diversifying our economy with a strong tech sector. It concerns me and, and we've got to do something about it. I think it should concern all of us, Bill. I think that during the first decade uh, under Act 221, we had a certain amount of local capital coming in. We had a certain amount of, uh, you know, attention and, and focus on this subject. And now in the lee of uh, Act 221, now that it's gone and forgotten, um, we can see retrospectively that it was useful. We can see retrospectively that we, when you do have an incentive, you do incentivize investment. And now we don't have the incentive and things seem so quiet. Uh, many of those companies that were funded with Act 221 are just reaching their stride. They're getting yeah. to the point where they've proven their concept or they're about to prove their concept and they're going to need more money. And there's no one standing by to help. Yes, some of these mainland firms will put a little money into Hawaii deals, and there are good deals out there, uh, but it's not enough. We have to have a lot of money coming in, a lot of money invested. We have to build a tech industry. We have to diversify the economy, and right away, there's no time to waste. So this is not good news, what you bring. Well, I hope it'll change. Uh, the Hawaii Strategic Development Corp. did get a $13 million grant but they've only been able to deploy a small percentage of it to one firm that focuses on tech transfer out of the university. Uh, but that's not the only source of deals. That's not the only source of entrepreneurs in Hawaii. So uh, let's reach into our pocketbooks and invest in our own backyard, Jay. Invest in Hawaii. It's really important, especially now. Thank you, Bill. And here's this week's report on the adventures of our co-working entrepreneur, Ray Chung Fujihira of TheBoxJelly.com. This week has been uh, crazy. Uh, we have a new possibility for a, um, a new space, and the space is in Waikiki, so we're pushing that through, and it's a, a partnership, so I'll let you know more about that. Hopefully, we'll go through. It looks really good. But um, right now, we're in the middle of Startup Weekend, which is really what's on my mind right now. 
Um, we've, we've been up pretty much all night. I had like three hours of sleep. Our programmers had like 30 minutes of sleep, you know, and uh, we're working on a project that is uh, for the food market. So we're hoping to uh, pitch to Dave McClure of 500 startups um, next week. And it's just, it's been a, it's been a great experience so far. Um, we have, there are about uh, eight different teams competing, you know, and we, we have a pretty, pretty strong team. So we have a shot to, to go at it and uh, uh, take this uh, first startup weekend here in Hawaii. I just came over here. We're, we're at the University of Phoenix. It's like a two minute walk. So I walked over here. Uh, I left my team. I told them I'll be gone for like 20 minutes. Come over here, you know, uh, talk to Think Tech Hawaii and then uh, come back and and finish up this project. So we have a, another, I'd say another uh, good 35 hours or something left. So we'll be we'll be cranking it out uh, all today. We'll be at the Box Jelly tonight, probably all night again. You know, we were, we were there all night uh, last night and uh, yeah. We're going to make it happen. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of Think Tech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. Thanks to the Scheidler Family Foundation, which supports a number of educational, cultural, and charitable organizations, including Think Tech. Hawaiian Electric Company and its affiliates Miko on Maui and Helco on the Big Island are deeply committed to the communities they serve. Galen Ho is a senior executive of BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company, and CEO of CBI Polymers, a tech company in Hawaii. Oceanit, another local tech company, is one of Hawaii's largest and most diversified science and engineering companies. Okay, Laurie, that wraps up this week's edition of Think Tech. Remember, you can watch Think Tech on OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Laurie and I do. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. You bet, Duke. For lots more ThinkTech videos and for underwriting, sponsorship, and internship opportunities on ThinkTech on OC16, visit thinktechhawaii.com. Be a sponsor. Help us reach Hawaii. I'm Duke Oishi. Thanks for joining us on ThinkTech. And I'm Lori Wingard. Aloha, everyone.